make sure you look at the left. Hi, I'm Major Eric Lombardini. I'm a veterinary pathologist with the U.S. Army, and I currently work for the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute in Bethesda, in Maryland. I did my training at AFIP, and while uh, fish are not a big part of our caseload there, it's always been my passion, and therefore I really appreciate the opportunity that Dr. Bruce Williams and uh, AFIP are giving me in terms of concentrating some of my time on the uh, gross pathology of fish and aquatic animals. For the most part, the slides that we're going to go through are, um, have been contributed or have been uh, garnered over the years. They are, for the most part, excellent photographs, and I very much appreciate the contribution of all of the individuals who provided them or who took the images. So let's go to the first slide. For the most part, I've credited the images within the slides themselves or at the end of the presentation. However, um, in some cases, I do not have the authors of the photographs, but their contribution is very, very much appreciated. Oxyethes is the taxonomic group of bony fish, which are predominantly subdivided into the ray-finned fishes. And uh, these represent about 99.9% .9 of what we as veterinary pathologists would deal with. And then the lobed finned fishes, such as the coelacanth, which uh, I think would be an extreme rarity that would come across somebody's necropsy table. Now, the term covers the vast majority of fish, which are an extremely diverse and abundant group, which consists of tens of thousands of species. It's the largest class of vertebrates in existence today. The other significant group to which we need to consider are the elasmobranchs, which are the cartilaginous fish, including sharks and rays. Um, but essentially what we're speaking about is a group of animals which consists of somewhere upwards of 30,000 species. This is critical because of the diversity of physical structure of the animals. So from a gross pathology standpoint, you could be dealing with everything from something as small as a uh, zebrafish all the way up to a whale shark. And as a result, you need to be extremely flexible in terms of your dealing with the anatomy and physiology of these animals. In no way can we assume that a fish is a fish is a fish. Therefore, any pathologist who's going to be dealing with fish from a gross pathology standpoint needs to be ready to um, be adaptive to the different forms and shapes and anatomical structures and physiologies that each patient would uh, present. In general, we know what the structure of a fish looks like. Um, this zebra fish, head at, the, head at the front, tail at the end, and essentially longitudinal body um, with the organs neatly in between. But the reality is that fish take so many different shapes when you're dealing with the flat fish, when you're dealing with um, some of the more uh, abnormal uh, eel type fish, etc. You need to realize that the anatomy is going to be different and therefore that the gross pathology will be different as well. One additional thing that I'll I'll add in at this point in time is the fact that the inflammatory response that fish will have, while we can for the most part generalize um, and say that it is generally a granulomatous response, um, certainly fish do present also with the acute granulocytic uh, form of response. And we need to um, avoid using the term either neutrophil or heterophil when speaking about fish if you don't know that it's been worked out. So my preference is to simply use the term granulocyte uh, or granulocytic inflammation when dealing with fish in general unless I know that uh, the actual granules within those cells have been worked out and it's been defined as either being a neutrophil or a heterophil. Speaking of viral diseases in fish, and what we're, going to go th what we're going to do with all of this lecture is instead of working through body systems, as you may be used to with some of the other lectures that you've seen, we're going to work um, from the basis of etiologies. And the purpose of this is simply the fact that unlike diseases of dogs, where you're dealing with a single species, here we're dealing with, as I said, potentially upwards of 30,000 different species. Therefore, it's easier 
to talk about etiologies rather than, um, than systems. There are a wide variety of viruses that have been identified in fish, and there are probably myriad that have uh, still to be discovered and will be discovered yearly. Certainly, um, if there's a caveat that, uh, that every species has its own herpes virus, if there are 30,000 species of fish, then we need to assume that there are potentially 30,000 different herpes viruses out there waiting to be discovered. Probably the most important um, and most common viral infection of aquarium fish is going to be lymphocystis, which is a, um, it's caused by a double-stranded DNA iridovirus. The disease has a worldwide distribution and can affect a wide variety of higher teleos. As I said, it is the most common viral infection of aquarium fish and for the most part presents as a self-limiting disease which affects those fish which are immunocompromised by some other underlying problem, usually associated with stressful crowded environments. The morphological diagnosis for this particular image is um, scaled skin, fibroblast hyperplasia, multifocal decoalescing, marked. The gross presentation of lymphocystis is often as small pale nodules which appear on the skin and fins, which first appear as a sprinkling of salt. Um, with each granule of salt, I, I say salt parenthetically, uh, or nodule is actually a single enlarged fibroblast, which is thousands of times the size of, the, of a normal fibroblast. The neighboring cells will then become infected as the nodules enlarge and um, rupture. But eventually all of these enlarged fibroblasts will form raspberry-like clusters, which are actually tightly clumped affected cells, with each nodule representing a single cell. The disease can um, become systemic and has been reported to cover the viscera and the mesentery. The gross differentials for uh, lymphocystis are um, predominantly epitheliocystis, um, ichthyotherius multifilis, or ich, the dermal sarcoma virus, and then the possibility also of trematode metasecaria from a, from a growth standpoint. But typically, ich and the parasites wouldn't cluster to form such large masses, and epitheliocystis is usually re restricted to the gills and the skin, and therefore we wouldn't see it um, systemically. Also, in terms of the dermal sarcoma virus, that tends to be species specific. And uh, we'll cover the dermal sarcoma virus a little later when we're discussing neoplasms. And so on to the herpes viruses. The um, morphological diagnosis in this case would be dermatitis, proliferative, multifocal to coalescing, moderate, but it could also be uh, scaled skin papilloma. This is a gross image of carp pox, which is called, caused by a suprinted herpes virus type 1. And like the aridovirus, as I said, there are probably as many fish herpes viruses as there are fish. Significant herpes viruses that we need to know are uh, this one, so the carp pox herpes virus, suprinted herpes virus type 1, but also hematopoietic necrosis herpes virus of goldfish, which is suprinted herpes virus type 2. Koi herpes virus, suprinted herpes virus type 3, which is uh, a very important virus that we'll talk about in a little bit. Channel catfish virus, which is also known as ictilurid herpes virus type 1. And the salmonid herpes virus 1 and 2. We will discuss uh, suprinted herpes virus type 1, this presentation, a little bit later when we also discuss neoplasm. But Essentially what you're looking at are these wax-like drops of um, proliferative material on the uh, scaled skin of the animal. It is, uh, these are herpes virus induced papillomas which can progress to squamous cell carcinoma and they make for a very nice gross image. Now I mentioned um, the koi herpes virus, or suprinted herpes virus type 3. It's closely related 
to suprinted herpes viruses type 1 and 2. And uh, all three of the suprinted viruses are related, albeit more distantly, to ictiluroid herpes virus type 1. This is a very hot topic right now, and because it causes significant morbidity and mortality in the common carp. What you're looking at is gill, bronchitis, necrotizing, multifocal decoalescing, severe. And the important thing to, to note in this case is that we would have to differentiate this from uh, columnaris disease, which we'll discuss later on. But the reality is that disease has a slightly different appearance, and this is uh, typically associated predominantly with common carp. Another example of suprinted herpes virus type 1, here we have scaled skin and fins, dermal erythema, multifocal, moderate. Common carp strains are the only reported host of a koi herpes virus, while goldfish and a few other species such as tilapia, surgeon, and uh, channel catfish are reported to be refractory. Disease patterns are typically influenced by water temperature and stocking density, but straight, stress, age, and the condition of the fish have also been reported to um, add to the viral virulence. So we spoke about earlier, this is um, another herpes virus of import. This is uh, ictiluroid herpes virus type 1, or channel catfish herpes virus. And it causes major epizootics in fry and fingerling catfish and represents a significant economic threat to the catfish industry as an outbreak can, results in about 100% mortality. This particular image, skin, dermatitis, necrohemorrhagic, multifocal decoalescing, severe with dermal infarcts. The catfish typically present with exophthalmia and ascites, and histologically the organs are affected um, in the order of severity being primarily the kidney, but then the liver, the GI, the spleen, skeletal muscle, neural tissue, and there was one report that suggested that the pancreatic tissue was least affected. And here's simply another image in some fingerling um, catfish showing the ascites and abdominal distension um, associated with ictiluroid herpes virus type 1. Another important group of fish viruses are the rhabdoviruses. In this case, in this gizzard shad, we're looking at is uh, scaled skin, dermatitis, hemorrhagic, multifocal, marked with dermal infarcts. And the disease in this case is a rhabdovirus which causes viral hemorrhagic septicemia, VHS. This is one of at least eight diseases that are caused by Picine rhabdoviruses. Um, and VHS has four different isolates, three of which are in Europe and one is in, the United, in North America. It causes rapid mortality with types 1 and 3, 1 through 3, 1, 2, and 3, uh, particularly affecting rainbow trout and turbot. And then type 4A is found in marine herring species. The virus is considered to be more virulent in colder water, less than 15 degrees um, centigrade. Here's another picture in gizzard shad. Again, dermatitis, necroulcerative, and hemorrhagic, multifocal to coalescing, severe, with dermal infarcts. And this is, again, VHS, or viral hemorrhagic septicemia, which is a Picine rhabdovirus. We have a few pictures of these. Here is the same disease in a walleye. And in this case, note that the uh, dermal infarcts are coalescing and forming a... Um, a much larger area of um, necrotizing disease within the, um, the cutaneous tissues. So morphological diagnosis, dermatitis, necroulcerative and hemorrhagic, multifocal to coalescing, severe with coalescing dermal infarcts. And again, viral hemorrhagic septicemia caused by a rhabdovirus. Here is a more acute uh, image of the disease experimentally infected in this yellow perch, again, with the Picine rhabdovirus. And then finally, as the disease attacks the internal organs, here hepatitis and splenitis, necrohemorrhagic, diffuse, severe, 
The histopathology associated with this disease is most significant in the kidney and liver. Um, and both, in both organs, there are typically large zones of necrosis which are centered on the melanomacrophage centers, um, which appear to be the primary infected cell type. This is another a disease of import that is, um, is reportable. Um, and this is spring viremia of carp caused by rhabdovirus carpio. It's predominantly found in European populations. It was first reported in North America in 2002. It is a reportable disease, and diseased fish typically present with exophthalmia, cutaneous petechiation, and abdominal distension. Hemorrhage and necrosis is typically noted in the spleen, the kidneys, the heart, the liver, the intestinal tract, and the swim bladder. And this fathead minnow, which has been experimentally infected with spring viremia of carp, you can see exophthalmia, the cutaneous petechiation, as well as the abdominal distension. The final disease we're going to talk about with viruses has to do with winter flounder. And it's a disease that hasn't been um, fully identified at this point, but because it appears to be seasonal and is associated with the change in temperature between um, winter and spring, it is believed that this is most likely viral. The disease has been reported in Maine and Canada and uh, began to appear back in 2001-2002 period. No fungal or um, bacterial elements have been isolated to date, however, as I said, the seasonality suggests that it's probably a viral etiology. In this case, skin, dermatitis, necroulcerative, multifocal severe. And the disease has been, uh, been titled ulcerative dermatitis in winter flounder. Okay. On to bacterial diseases of fish. The one important thing, the first few slides that you're going to see in this series are uh, nonspecific signs of sepsis. And one important thing to note in fish is that often what you're seeing, the gross presentation, ends up being from inside out. Therefore, when you're thinking about the, uh, the pathogenesis of some of these disease processes, you need to be considering the vascular element and the fact that a cutaneous ulceration most likely has a, um, a dermal infarct as part of its um, as component of presentation. So we're going to look at some, some general nonspecific signs of sepsis in a variety of fish first, and then we'll get into some specific etiologies. So in these Siamese fighting fish, what you're looking at is essentially ascites. And the, the fish take on this porcupine appearance where the, the um, scales are move from being parallel to the body to more perpendicular, or at least at an angle. And this disease is colloquially known as dropsy, but essentially it is um, ascites, which obviously associated with the dysregulation of the animal's ability to, um, to regulate its osmolality. It is a sign of nonspecific sepsis and will occur in any, any species of fish, so nothing nothing specific associated with this, but something you need to be considering when you're seeing um, this presentation in a fish. And here's another nonspecific sign, exophthalmia, unilateral, severe, another sign of nonspecific sepsis. Cutaneous hemorrhages, again, probably an earlier presentation that would then proceed to uh, possibility of a cutaneous uh, ulceration or dermal infarct, but you'll often see cutaneous hemorrhaging within the fins, around the vent, and um, uh, around the, the, um, the head as well. As I said, with sepsis, what you're often looking at in fish is going to be a presentation that, that involves a vascular element and then has a dermal infarct with subsequent erosion and ulceration. So think that a lot of these diseases are presenting from inside out. And in this case, the focally extensive 
dermal infarct with um, cutaneous ulceration. And here in this angelfish, multifocal to coalescing, um, dermal infarcts with cutaneous ulceration, and these are uh, nonspecific signs of sepsis. Okay, now to move into specific etiologies. The gross presentation here, hepatitis, necrohemorrhagic, multifocal to coalescing, moderate, and this is a typical presentation of Eremonis hydrophila. Being part of the modal Eremonis uh, septicemia, or MAS, it uh, is a very common bacterial disease caused by an Eremonid, which typically affects warm water fish, both in commercial production systems and in natural water. The clinical signs range from sudden death with high morbidity to, uh, in per acute cases, to superficial and deep skin lesions. There often will be um, necrosis and hemorrhage at the base of the fins, and these lesions will progress systemically as well. In this trout, we're looking at a scaled skin, dermatitis, necroulcerative, multifocal to coalescing, severe. And this is caused by Eremonis salmonacida. Typically, it's also known as um, furunculosis in, um, in these animals, and it occurs in one of several forms. Um, the percute form is found in fingerlings, and these fish usually have a dark discoloration and die rapidly without any other perimetry signs. The gross lesions may resemble those that are observed in the acute form of the disease, which usually will show premature signs of anorexia occurring for two to three days prior to death. The gross lesions in the acute form typically involve hemorrhage of the liver and splenomegaly. The disease can then progress to the subacute form, which has a much slower onset of clinical signs with petechial hemorrhages being observed in the skin and around the fins. Fish will usually show um, focal to coalescing discoloration and anorexia and then die approximately um, within, a, within a week after the onset of clinical signs. And the gross lesions in this case will involve the typical uh, furuncles as well as internal list, um, lesions that we saw within the acute form. If the animal survives the um, subacute form of the disease, which is seen again in this image, Eventually, it'll progress to the chronic form, which is characterized by healing of the furuncles and dermal scarring. Those animals um, can recover, but typically exhibit poor weight gain and may show continued discoloration. Okay, we're back to Eremonis hydrophila, which is considered to be the most important etiology of severe outbreaks of disease in freshwater fish. The bacterium is ubiquitous, and fish can be, become infected throughout the year. However, the most severe epizootics, in carp at least, appear to occur most frequently during the spring due to the stress of the temperature change. The histopathology usually consists of necrohemorrhagic lesions in the kidney, spleen, heart, liver, gonad, pancreas, and the skin. And this often will mimic what you'll see grossly as well. In this image, we're looking at um, scaled skin, dermatitis, necroulcerative, multifocal to coalescing, severe. And while this could be certainly a non-specific sign of sepsis, this happens to be Eremonis hydrophila as well. Um, dermatitis, rhabdomyositis, potentially progressing as far as osteomyelitis, necroulcerative, focally extensive, severe and as I said, Eremonis hydrophila. And same presentation in another animal, progressing even further. Within a short period of time, this animal will lose its tail completely. This fish is presenting with a case of bacterial um, ophthalmitis and is caused by Streptococcus ineae. The streptococcal diseases of fish are not particularly common, however, when they do occur, significant mortality can result. Um, streptococcus does not appear to be a truly opportunistic pathogen, uh, therefore is most likely primary. 
as it can be more aggressive than a lot of the other environmental bacteria that are found. And um, interestingly, so the, the um, disease is believed to have been responsible for a major mortality in reef fish in the Caribbean basin in the late 1990s, which almost completely wiped out the entire fish population from the reefs around, um, around several of the windward islands. The source of the infection was never established, but it was suspected to be due to a se severely heavy outfall from the Orinoco River. Mm. Part of the reason for this is that um, Strep Inier is also found with the marine mammals that are within the Orinoco. And um, the disease is, was originally described as dolphin inia of freshwater dolphins in the Amazon basin. It is a zoonotic disease that can cause encephalitis in humans, and it causes, as I said, um, major disease in farmed warm water fish. There was an experimental study that looked at populations of zebrafish and minnows that were ex exposed to a high concentration of strep NEA in the water, and there was 100% uh, mortality associated with this. This presentation, these trout fingerlings, especially the one to the left, is a, uh, is a great gross image that could very well be, uh, be used to, for testing. Looking at stomatitis, necrohemorrhagic, diffuse, severe. And the colloquial name is enteric red mouth, also known as Hagerman's red mouth disease, red mouth, or salmonid blood spot. It's produced by a systemic bacterial infection and it primarily infects hatchery-raised rainbow trout. And the etiology is Yersinia ruckeri. Um, enteric red mouth is responsible for severe hemorrhagic infections in, in hatchery-raised salmonids, primarily salmon and trout, throughout Canada and the United States. Non-salmonid fish such as uh, emerald dace, goldfish, carp, and lake heron have been reported to harbor the pathogen, but don't typically show um, signs of disease. The histopathology includes bacterial colonization of the well-vascularized tissues and hemorrhage of the gills, kidney, liver, spleen, heart, as well as the muscle. Gross presentation here in the seahorse, dermatitis, necroulcerative, multifocal decoalescing marked. And in this case, what we're looking at is uh, vibriosis. Vibrio is reported in freshwater fish, and the disease can cause significant mortality of greater than 50% in fish culture facilities once an outbreak is in progress. Um, the common names for Vibrio infection in fish include red pest of eels, saltwater frunculosis, red boil, and pike pest. And Vibrio infections can spread rapidly when the fish are confined in heavy stocked commercial systems, with morbidity and mortality reaching all almost as high as 100% um, in affected facilities. As the disease progresses, the skin can become discolored, um, hemorrhagic, and necrotic with boil-like sores which appear on, the, on the, the skin, which occasionally break through and become ulcerated. And these result in um, secondary bacterial infections which mix with the vibrio. Um, occasionally, there'll be erythematous lesions around the fin and the mouth and then the same systemic signs that we saw earlier in the bacterial section with exophthalmia and uh, ascites. And here's another example in this seahorse, dorsal crest, dermatitis, necroulcerative, focally extensive, marked. And again, this is Vibrio species. Here's a very important disease. Um, caused by Rennibacterium salmonarium, and this is bacterial kidney disease. Nephritis, necrotizing, granulomatous, multifocal to coalescing, severe. And this is a great gross image, um, which this disease should be popping up at the very top of your differential list when you see this presentation. The disease primarily affects salmonids, especially ra ra rainbow trout, um, brown and brook trout, as well as Chinook and coho salmon. And any age of fish is susceptible to the disease, but the, lo the losses are usually don't occur until the fish are, are full grown. Um, fish with bacterial kidney disease may have no external lesions 
or they may also present with a cutaneous discoloration, exophthalmus, pale gills, uh, ascites, and hemorrhaging around the vent and the base of the fins. When the, they have the cutaneous lesions, these usually present as small vesicles along the flanks and is known as spawning rash. And these fluid fills, filled vesicles can rupture to form cutaneous ulcers. The major target organ is the kidney, uh, which may have large white raised coalescing granulomas as we're seeing in this image. But these granulomas have also been observed in the spleen, the liver, the pancreas, and the heart in advanced and severe cases. And here's another example, more severe in this case, in this trout, with um, nephritis, granulomatous, diffuse, severe. Again, bacterial kidney disease, rhinobacterium, salmonarium, and um, grossly, it might be difficult to differentiate this disease from mycobacteriosis or, or nocardiosis, but because of the fact that the kidney is being specifically targeted in the salmonid, should put uh, BKD high up on your differential list. The disease progresses through bacterial replication within the macrophages, and the histopathologic presentation can often be extremely distinctive with the macrophages being um, pregnant with intracytoplasmic bacteria. This is one more presentation that the disease can have in, uh, with bacterial kidney disease in this sockeye salmon. There can often be, or often, with, with chronicity you can see muscular cavitation with um, large cystic cavitations forming within the muscle and these will often be filled with an opaque liquid. Another extremely classic gross image. This is caused by Edwardsiella ictiluri and causes enteric septicemia of catfish or ESC. It's probably the most important bacterial disease of catfish and it has a very high predilection for channel catfish but has occasionally been reported in the other ictilurids such as the brown bullhead, blue and white catfish. In this case the morphological diagnosis is um, associated with the fact that this disease is coming from the inside out. It is causing a meningitis and a necrotizing meningitis with subsequent um, osteomyelitis and then cutaneous ulceration. Um, there are two forms of ESC which are directly related to the route of exposure in these animals. The acute form, the bacteria are ingested into the GI and then enter the bloodstream through the intestine with subsequent colonization of the internal organs and result in necrosis of these organs. Internally, the peritoneal cavity can, will often contain a bloody or clear fluid with hemorrhage and necrosis of the liver, as well as splenic and renal hypertrophy. With chronicity, the bacteria will enter the catfish, or I'm sorry, with the chronic form, the bacteria will enter the catfish through the nervous system by invading the olfactory organ through the nasal opening and then migrates up the olfactory nerve into the brain, where the infection will then spread from the meninges into the skull and finally through the skin forming the classic quote-unquote hole in the head lesion which is a uh, raised or open ulcer in the frontal bone of the skull. Now a hole in the head disease is the colloquial term for this disease but there are other diseases which also have been given uh, similar names and so to avoid confusion I think it's better to run with the um, enteric septicemia of catfish and know the etiology to be Edwardsiella Edwardsiella ictiluri, and this is a very important disease to know. Another Edwardsiella, this is emphysematous putrefactive disease, or EPD, and it's caused by Edwardsiella tarda. It's been isolated from the intestinal tract of domestic animals and is found within organically polluted waters. It's um, much, less of, much less common than um, enteric septicemia of catfish, and is more of a problem in older channel catfish, although fingerlings are also susceptible. This disease will affect a wide variety of fish, and usually um, what will be seen grossly are initially small red cutaneous foci on the flanks and the caudal peduncle, and then these will form into fistulas, uh, which 
will uh, track deeply into the um, underlying skeletal muscle. The petechiation and malodorous liquefactive necrosis of the viscera with the fibrinous peritonitis follows, which gives is the reason for the name of emphysematous putrefactive disease. And um, catfish that are affected by this disease will continue to eat even though if they're severely affected. One other thing that we'll often see is uh, posterior paresis in the later stages of the disease. In this case, gross presentation, panophthalmitis, necrohemorrhagic, focally extensive, severe, with exophthalmia. The gross presentation in this case is, is pretty straightforward, whole body emaciation. And this is a, um, this is often the only sign that you might see of mycobacteriosis affecting a population of fish, that uh, they seem to, to manage quite well even though they might have overwhelming mycobacterial infections within their kidneys and livers. Typically, just a few fish are affected. However, with the stress and certain virulent strains, entire populations can be affected. And then you end up having high levels of morbidity and mortality. The problem is if, if one animal in a communal population is infected, then the entire population has to be considered exposed and potentially infected. And really to eradicate mycobacterium from a circulating um, Circulating, cir circulating filtration system requires completely dismantling the uh, system, euthanasia of the fish, and, um, and bleaching the entire system and starting again. It is probably one of the most important diseases of aquarium fish that we'll run across. The clinical signs, as I said, will include emaciation and poor growth, and there's actually retarded sexual maturation in these animals as well. The gross lesions will include skeletal deformities, uh, occasionally chronic non-healing shallow uh, to deep ulceration and fin erosion, while internally there will be um, small coalescing white nodules which can be present within the viscera, including predominantly the liver and the kidney. Histopathology will reveal a chronic inflammatory response with large numbers of the epithelioid macrophages surrounding the bacterium, and um, the disease is, should be strongly suspected based on the presence of acid-fast staining bacteria within these lesions. The gross morphological diagnosis in this case, abdominal cavity, peritonitis, hepatitis, splenitis, granulomatous, multifocal, severe, and again, mycobacterium species. The predominant species that we need to consider in, in fish um, are Mycobacterium marinum, fortuitum, but also ulcerans, chelone, flavensis, and there's a variety of others as well, depending on species and um, geographic location of the disease. One thing that is important to note is that that gross presentation of a granulomatous hepatitis or nephritis doesn't necessarily mean that you're dealing with mycobacterium because in fact nocardia and francisella can also present with similar gross presentations but mycobacterium is probably the most common and therefore should be at the top of your list but you could also include um, nocardia seriole and francisella phylomiragia in your differential list, depending on the species. The Francisella is uh, an emerging disease right now in Atlantic cod, whereas Nocardia has been seen in aquarium fish. Another important bacterial disease to discuss is, uh, is this one, and this is peduncle disease, um, also called saddleback. We're dealing with a cellulitis necrotizing focally extensive severe with pigmenta pigmentary loss caused by Flavobacterium columnare. So columnaris disease is, um, is another colloquial name and the condition will cause this area of gray discoloration which uh, is why the disease is called also saddleback. Diseases are, the lesions are usually confined to the skin at the, on the head and the back as well as the gills although other parts of the body can also be involved. Gastrointestinal, um, so no, I apologize, 
scratch that. The gill lesions are highly necrotizing and uh, will quickly compromise the respiratory tract, leading to death of the animal, whereas the skin lesions will often begin as whitish plaques and then rapidly progress to hemorrhagic ulcers. In this koi, the gross morphological diagnosis here, um, gill branchitis, necrotizing, multifocal decoalescing, severe. And you can see why this would need to be differentiated from um, KHV that we discussed in the viral section based on the necrotizing lesion, although this doesn't typically present as much of a um, hemorrhagic look to it as we saw within the, um, within the earlier uh, lesion in the koi. So this is again columnaris disease and um, as I said the gill lesions will be highly necrotizing and then will eventually compromise respiration and lead to, to um, death. In Salmonids the Flavobacterium um, branchiophilium will cause bacterial gill disease and then Flavobacterium uh, Psychrophilium will result in peduncle disease in the fingerling trouts. And this also has a, um, a similar look to the Flavobacterium columnaris that we saw in the last few slides. All right, on to protozoal diseases. And these zebrafish we're looking at is a protozoal kyphosis or scoliosis and it's associated with microsporidium. Microsporidia are probably the most important pathogenic uh, fish microparasite. They're obligate intracellular organisms and on electron microscopy they'll have, um, they'll be unicellular spores with either a uni or binucleate sporoplasm, some form of an extru extrusion apparatus and a polar tube and cap. This extrusion apparatus can actually be seen on histopathology and with a variety of special stains you can, you can highlight it uh, in these fish. The phylum of microsporidium, microsporidiae contains, um, among others, microsporidium, plastophora, loma, and glugia. And staying with that theme, this is plastophora um, hyphosinobriconis which has been known in the literature as uh, neon tetra disease, but that's simply because it was first reported and found in neon tetras. It also affects a variety of other tetras and um, interestingly cardinal tetras are actually resistant to the, to the disease. It is caused by a microsporidian and signs of plastophora are this grayish white waxy or opaque areas in the musculature which ought to be normally translucent or even transparent. The long iridescent color bands of tetras um, can become pale, patchy, or even lost in color. And uh, affected fish tend to show typical clinical signs of um, emaciation and, uh, and disease such as restlessness and scraping themselves along, along the bottom. The affected muscle eventually turns white and the bleach areas will, will start to expand. Then emaciation ensues and um, occasionally there will be hollow and cystic areas within the musculature. Eventually the spine may become deformed and swimming motion will become erratic and um, swim bladder control will also be affected. Um, but those may also be associated with secondary bacterial infections caused by eventual um, uh, immunocompromise associated with the emaciation and the disease progress. I only have a couple of slides of aquatic animals that are not fish, and, um, but this is one of them, just because it is a very nice presentation of microsporidian in this prawn. The Gross morphological diagnosis here, muscle, myositis, necrotizing, diffuse, severe. And this microsporidium species has caused a similar necrotizing process as we would see 
potentially with a neon tetra disease, although in this case it's quite progressed and is causing the, the muscle to look white, almost like a heat processed tissue, when in fact what the tissue should look like is translucent or, um, or even transparent. Infected prawns will also lose their uh, typically shiny cutaneous um, body surface and will have certain areas which will, um, will become completely depigmented. In this yellow tail, the, again, the morphological diagnosis, skeletal muscle, um, necrotizing myositis, myositis necrotizing, multifocal to coalescing, severe. And this is Beco disease, Beco disease. It's a microsporidium seriale. And the, the cysts that we're seeing within the musculature uh, are normally host adapted as long as they remain intact. But once the cysts begin to degenerate and rupture, a pronounced inflammatory response is elicited and the neighboring myocytes undergo a form of liquefactive necrosis. Um, this will eventually lose, lead to a, an actual collapse of the musculature and, and grossly the fish may appear with concave um, body surfaces due to loss of the liquefactive loss of the underlying musculature. Uh, the heavy infections will often lead to the death of the fish. Another microsporidian parasite, but one which causes xenomas. This is um, uh, Glugia stefani, and in this case what we're looking at is enteritis, granulomatous, multifocal to coalescing, severe, with intralesional protozoal xenomas. Uh, usually what we'll see is this presentation, opaque xenomas on the external wall of the digestive tract, and it'll often affect the flatfish. There was a study that was conducted to determine the effects, geographic distribution, and prevalence of this microsporidian parasite in winter flounder in, um, in North America. And it was found that there was a marked increase in affected animals in areas that were uh, contaminated. And it's suggesting that immunocompromise may actually affect the, um, the progress of the disease. Eventually, the cysts will, um, within the wall of the digestive tract, will cause proliferative inflammation, granuloma formation, and focal necrosis. And this can actually progress also into the liver and kidney. There was a seasonal predilection associated with this as well, but most likely that simply added to the, um, the effect of the immunocompromise that they were seeing associated with contaminated water as well. Here's another presentation of the same disease, intestine, enteritis, granulomatous, multifocal to coalescing, uh, marked with intralesional xenomas. And this is Glugia stefani. A xenoma is essentially an extremely enlarged host cell that's filled with spores and the, the various de developmental stages of the microsporidia. And unlike the other microsporidia uh, that we saw previously, this parasite is um, the, the glugia is the only one that you're going to see macroscopically as a single cyst. In this IU, again, glugia species, enteritis, granulomatous, diffuse, severe, with protozoal xenomas. And um, just as we saw in the flatfish, ex on the external surface of the digestive tract, but also in this case invading the liver, and the other visceral organs um, and causing the same proliferative inflammation, granuloma formation, and focal necrosis, um, which can spread from the serosal surface into the actual parenchyma of the organs. Interestingly, on this animal also, if you look underneath the eye, there are cutaneous xenomas as well. In this stickleback, dermatitis, granulomatous, focally extensive, severe, with intralesional protozoal cysts. And you can see how big these xenomas can get. Um, 
when the thick-walled spore is ingested by the host, the sporoplasm is discharged from within the spore and then migrates to the target organ and begins to proliferate. And the proliferating glugia will accumulate in these cysts or xenomas. And um, in the sticklebacks in particular, the xenomas can occur in virtually any tissue and are often visible as white cysts bulging from the skin surface. Glugia is highly contagious because when the mature spores um, rupture, the, well, when the mature cysts rupture, the spores are released into the water and that's how they will then infect the superficial cutaneous surface of the fish. On to the Myxosporidia. In this salmon, rhabdomyositis, granulomatous, multifocal, mild, with intralesional myxosporidian cysts. And this is myxospora species. Um, these, these infections are more common um, and therefore also more pathogenic for wild fish uh, or fish that are reared intensively in outdoor fish ponds. The organisms tend to be host and tissue specific and therefore the expression of the disease is, is related to the host and the, um, and the tissue. And the, the difference between this image and the last one is in the last image you also had these necrotizing uh, cavitating lesions versus in this case these are relatively, um, relatively host adapted. This is uh, again rhabdomyositis granulomatous multifocal mild with intralesional myxosporidian cysts and it's caused by Henigaya salmonicola. This disease was described in the uh, in 1919 due to muscular cysts that were um, noted in silver salmon that were caught in Alaska and these will have a similar process of infection as the uh, as glugia rupturing through the integument and then releasing spores in the water and occasionally those then ulcerated open cutaneous wounds are going to be colonized by secondary bacterial infections which will complicate the disease process. Henigaya is commonly found um, as a white cystic le skin lesion in cultured catfish as well as aquarium fish and it can be um, it can be commonly seen as in this presentation on the gills and so I would use an etiological diagnosis here myxosporidial branchitis couple more and then we'll end up taking a break. This catfish has branchitis, necroproliferative, diffuse, severe. This is an important disease which has a couple of possible etiological agents. This is the colloquially known hamburger gill disease. Um, and what you're also seeing is lamellar fusion, blunting, and loss and this histiocytic and proliferative response within the gills. The Two agents which are potentially associated are uh, Rantiectinomyxon species or Henigaya ictiluri. Um, the gills of affected fish are severely swollen and bloody, resulting in this colloquial name of hamburger gill disease. And a presumptive di diagnosis can be made through a wet mount of the infected gill tissue with filaments appearing swollen, clubbed, and broken. There's cartilaginous necrosis, which is also strongly supportive of a diagnosis of proliferative gill disease. And here's another nice presentation of it. Branchitis, necroproliferative, diffuse, severe, and uh, oranacti, antiactinomyxon species, or henigot. All right, on to part two. We're going to continue with uh, protozoal diseases, and then from there we'll move on to the macroparasites, some uh, neoplastic diseases that are species-specific or are important within the domain of science, and then finish up with some miscellaneous diseases. So first slide, please. All right, in this trout, this is a, a beautiful disease. This, the morphological diagnosis here could be chondrodysplasia, diffuse severe with chondrous necrosis and loss. And this is the presentation that we would see with the um, most pathogenic uh, fish mixozoans which is uh, Myxobolus cerebralis, causing the colloquially named whirling disease um, on the West Coast. 
All Salmonids are uh, susceptible to infection with this disease and it's been responsible for the marked decline of several wild species of trout in western U.S. The rainbow trout is considered to be the most sensitive while brown trout are often asymptomatic. The um, severity of the disease is related to the age of exposure with about 100% mortality occurring in fry and fingerlings while fish that are older than six months are often asymptomatic. The organism causes this stereotypical whirling which is associated with the uh, parasites feeding on cartilage um, causing damage and uh, results in constriction of the spinal cord and the brain stem as the parasite attacks the spinal column. The um, Microscopically, what you'll end up seeing is a granulomatous and necrotizing chondritis with the intralesional um, mixosporidia, mixosporidia. And occasionally, you'll see a black tail as well, and that's also theorized to be caused by um, a neuritis associated with insult to the caudal nerves, and which are supposed to be responsible for deposition of pigment. The differentials in this case would, for scoliosis, would be um, hypovitaminosis C and potentially mycobacteriosis. However, I really can't conceive of any other significant differential for this kind of facial deformity associated with chronic uh, chondritis, necrotizing chondritis. Now here's another example of the disease in this trout where we have a a significant um, kyphosis or scoliosis and this is what ends up causing the erratic swimming or the whirling disease. Again, Myxobolus cerebralis and um, the parasite is a, is a metazoan which penetrates the head and spinal cartilage of the fingerling and then multiplies very rapidly and it'll also put pressure on the organ of equilibrium which is in part uh, so you have, you have two different factors that are affecting the, the whirling, the stereotypical whirling. One is the impact on the organ of equilibrium, and two has to do with, the, with chronicity, damage to the spinal column. Moving on to a, probably one of the best known protozoal diseases in fish, um, Ichthyotherius multifilis, or ick. The morphological diagnosis in these two fish would be epithelial hyperplasia, multifocal, marked, with intralesional protozoa. It's the largest parasitic protozoa in a fish. It's a ciliated protozoan, and it affects warm water fish worldwide um, and is often seen in animals that are stressed in aquarium settings. Fish that, um, fish that are scaleless are usually ex especially sensitive or vulnerable, so that's why the catfish tend to be um, all the more so. However, it, it can affect a wide range of fish, and it is quite contagious within um, overcrowded situations. Fish that survive the infection can develop immunity to reinfection that can last for several months, and um, a variety of fish are highly susceptible, but cats and sunfish, carp and goldfish have been reported as being amongst the most so. So, morphological diagnosis, epithelial hyperplasia, multifocal, marked, with intralesional protozoa, and ichthyotherius multifilis, or ich. Now, there is a marine equivalent to, um, to ich, and it is actually called marine ich. Again, epithelial hyperplasia, multifocal, minimal, with intralesional protozoa, and this is caused by cryptocarion irritans. It has the same essential life cycle and um, causes similar lesions in saltwater fish. Early stages of lymphocystis virus might have a similar appearance, which is why uh, it needs to be considered in the list of differentials. However, typically, um, it will not, not form the very, very large uh, nodules or clusters of, as we see with lymphocystis. And histology in the case of both 
Cryptocaryon and Ichthyotherius is, um, is diagnostic, with the protozoa having this very large horseshoe um, macronucleus. This is a very interesting disease, which has changed name recently. Um, it used to be caused, uh, used to be called uh, Costia necator, but it's now Ichthyobodo necator. But it still retains the name of the colloquial name of Costiasis. In this case, what we're looking at is epithelial hyperplasia and erosion, diffuse, severe. It is a disease which will often affect um, discus, as in this case, and but it can, it can affect practically every species of freshwater fish. Ichthyoboda is found as either a free-swimming form, which is a small oval parasite measuring approximately 10 to 15 micrometers in length with uh, two unequal flagella, um, or as an attached form with which penetrates the epithelium and you can't see microscopically the, the flagella at that point. The parasite will cause this initial hyperplasia of the malphigian cells with an eventual exhaustion of the goblet cells in the, in the host. This then leads to a multifocal to coalescing epithelial spongiosis with subsequent erosion and eventual ulceration and then secondary bacterial infections. And death usually follows due to uh, osmoregulatory failure. The typical gross presentation of this disease is this um, gray appearance to an emaciated fish and somewhat of a flaky look to the, the epithelium. But the gray look is, is considered to be quite typical. A couple of other protozoal diseases will cause this uh, presentation. In this case, gross morphological diagnosis, dermatitis and rhabdomyositis, probably actually as well an osteomyelitis within the ribs, necroulcerative, focally extensive, severe. And this particular case in this, uh, this angelfish is caused by uranema marinum. Um, however, Brucinella hostilis is another ciliated parasite which can also affect the, the skin of uh, marine fish. Brucinella is often referred to as causing clownfish disease, however, in both cases, the, disease, the parasites are opportunistic and they can infect a wide variety of fish species. The major difference in gross pathology between Brucinella hostilis and Uranema marinum is that the lesions associated with Uranema marinum often will have a more defined margin between the thickened mucus layer and the normal skin, which is often red and inflamed. Okay, we're going to move on now to uh, fungal diseases of fish. And the majority of infections with fungus are as a secondary opportunistic invader, um, as with cases of the uh, Aramonas infection. However, primary saprolignosis has been described in cultured eels. Predisposing factors for infection usually are considered to be temperature. Um, catfish in southern United States are affected by what are called winter kills, in which Affected fish will so, show these saprolegnia plaques on their skin during the winter, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that. And then overcrowding and trauma. The, um, the gross presentation will often be, as we see here, this cotton-like um, uh, filamentous um, proliferation which is seen when the fish is out of water, or in this case, the egg, when the fish is in the water, I apologize, or as in this case with the eggs. Once the, the fish has been removed from water, the fungal hyphae will collapse down onto the surface of the infected tissue. Now, in this case, what we're looking at is necrosis, diffuse, severe with fungal hyphae uh, caused by saprolegnia. And affected eggs are gonna have this, this cotton white-like appearance to them. Less commonly, fish will be affected by deep ulcerative necrotic mycosis with severe inflammation, muscle necrosis, abundant hyphae, tissue sloughing, and there are rare reports of infection of the gastrointestinal tract of small fry with penetration into the viscera. In these cases, 
The gross morphological diagnosis would be dermatitis, necroulcerative, multifocal to coalescing, severe, with hyphal mats. Seprolegnia is generally a secondary pathogen, as I said, though in the right circumstances it could, it can act and has been reported to do so to act as a primary uh, infective agent. It most frequently targets fish um, within both wild and tank environments. Through, the, through cellular necrosis and other epithelial or epidermal damage, saprolignia can spread through the surface of the, the host as this cotton-like film. It typically stays within the epidermal layers, um, and it's not, it's not tissue or species specific. A saprolignia infection can be fatal, though, as osmoregulation becomes difficult with enough damage to the, um, the overlying epithelium. And here's one of the cases of winter kill in a catfish. And this animal is, uh, has a presentation of dermatitis, necroulcerative, focally extensive, severe with a fungal mat. And this is caused by saprolegnia. And I think you can appreciate here where, in comparison to the image of the fish eggs that were within the water where the, the fungal hyphae were extending upwards from the egg and forming this, that cotton-like appearance, to here where the fish is out of water and there's a complete collapse of all those fungal hyphae into this thick fungal mat on top of the ulcerated lesion. And these winter kills can progress um, to very severe ulceration as you see with the middle animal having completely lost its tail. So in this case, dermatitis, rhabdomyositis, osteomyelitis, necrotizing, focally extensive, severe. And here's just another example of an aquarium fish with a fungal dermatitis associated with saprolegnia. All right, on to parasitic diseases. There are many, many, many parasites that um, are associated with this wide variety of fish. And from the standpoint for, um, for those in the audience who are pathology residents who are considering taking the board exam, I don't think that the actual scientific names are going to be all that critical um, to be memorized. It's more important to be able to distinguish microscopically the, the various features of the different macroparasites and be able to tell what general category we're dealing with. There are a few, and I'll try to emphasize those that are of import, um, but for the most part, it's more important to recognize the, um, the gross presentation rather than knowing the actual scientific Latin name. And here is a, a case of a um, muscular nematodiasis. This is not a necroulcerative lesion. The fish has actually been cut open here to reveal the, um, the muscular nematodes that are actually host adapted in this case. The severity of disease in fish with nematodes will vary with life stage, the species, and the number of nematodes that are present. Um, obviously the age and species of the infected fish and the sites of infection. And although adult nematodes are typically found within the fish intestinal tracts, adults in other stages can be found in almost any organ. And um, as in this presentation, are often uh, found commonly within the muscle. And Enosacus, which is a um, one nematode of import, we'll look at a few examples of it can be found within the viscera um, or within the musculature. Visible signs of infection may include cutaneous hemorrhage, external nodules, or the histological evidence of inflammation, necrosis, and cysts or granulomas that are centered upon um, parasites, especially those that are degenerating or dying. In this Alaskan pollock, see an example of um, Anisacus simplex, which is called the herring worm. And it's an, important, uh, it's an important parasite because of the fact that it is zoonotic. The life cycle will involve crustaceans and fish and then marine mammals. But it is zoonotic often, most often, through the consumption of um, poorly prepared sushi. But in this case, in this Alaskan pollock, the Anisacus appears to be completely 
host adaptin is not causing any kind of a true inflammatory process, at least grossly. And in the snapper, the same thing. Again, we're looking at Anisacus simplex um, uh, along the ovary of this snapper. We're looking at here etiologically, we're look, the etiological diagnosis in this case might be erythematous parasitic dermatitis. And this is a nice presentation of um, Eustrongyloides species, which during the development, this, um, this species of nematode will migrate through the, broad, the body of the fish, causing these worm tracks. Now, extensive migration by large numbers of the nematodes can cause significant inflammation and tissue destruction. Um, and large larval stages of some nematode species, including the Eustrongyloides species, may cause enough physical pressure on the organs uh, to cause visceral damage as well as abdominal distension. But this is a nice gross presentation of Eustrongyloides, this, this migration tract, this erythematous migration tract immediately within the subcutaneous tissues. Etiological diagnosis here, gastric acanthocephaliasis. The, um, all acanthocephalids will usually require an intermediate host, which is typically an arthropod, and the larval form can penetrate the host body and either insist um, if the host is a peritonic host or develop into adults in the final host. Usually, these are relatively host adapted and don't cause any trouble. However, large infections and uh, the fact that the parasite is, is uh, attached into the mucosa of the, of the gastrointestinal system can eventually cause erosion, um, ulceration, and then a peritonitis secondary to rupture of the gastrointestinal tract. Etiological diagnosis, muscular cestodiasis. Um, this is Bothriocephalus species, and there are a variety of cestodes which can affect fish. It would be truly impossible, unless you are a parasitologist, to memorize all of them. Um, some of them are host adapted, and others are um, pathogenic. However, in this case, I think the more important thing is to recognize histologically the, uh, the general category of etiology, rather than the specific name. In this common jo jolly tail, there is, uh, again, Salomic cestodiasis. Uh, there are a few, one, one tapeworm that you could memorize, um, simply to have one in your toolbox would be um, Diphilobothrium latham, which I believe is also zoonotic, and that is called the broad fish tapeworm. But again, based on the specific species, based on the, the geographic location, there will be uh, a lot of variation in terms of the different species. On to trematodes. Within this kingfish, the etiological diagnosis would be cutaneous trematode uh, metacercariasis. And in this case, what we're looking at is the white grub. Um, now, usually these are uh, parasites which affect the kidneys, the liver, and the heart, but they've been reported to also be found within the um, cutaneous tissues as well as within the spleen, intestinal wall, and the ovaries. Two other, so the, the, the trematodes are broken colloquially into three different categories, the black grubs, the white grubs, and the yellow grubs. The black grubs, um, uvulifer, Amblyphlitis cause what is called black spot disease, and the metasecaria usually embed within the skin in the musculature and then are surrounded by fibrosis and melanomacrophage aggregates, which give the skin this peppered appearance. Um, as I said, the white grubs are usually found within the viscera, and then the yellow grubs also will be found embedded intramuscularly or, or within the subcutaneous tissues. So in this white sucker, what we're looking at is an example of uvulifer, or the black grub disease. Um, again, in this 
In this case, it's uh, metacercaria, which are surrounded by fibrosis and then melanomacrophage aggregates. Um, they can be found anywhere along the, the host. Herons and kingfishers are considered to be the definitive hosts and snails are the first intermediate hosts with fish being the second. And here's the yellow grub. And in this case, in this western minnow, etiological diagnosis, cutaneous trematode metasacariasis. And same thing in this hybrid sunfish. As you recall, I suggested that um, the Trematode metasicaria could be considered as a differential for the um, uh, iridoviral infection, and this is why this presentation. Certainly, you would probably want to look uh, microscopically to rule out between those between the two um, presentations. Although, typically, the metasicaria don't tend to aggregate like this presentation. However, you need to consider it. This is a very interesting parasite, Diplostonum um, spathoceum, causing cataractic change, subcapsular multifocal moderate with intralenticular trematode metasicaria. The eye fluke disease, in, in this case the metasicaria insists within the ocular lens in many species causing this parasitic cataract. There's negligible inflammation unless the parasite dies and the lens is the only location in which the parasite can mature. Uh, the histopathology in this case is often a subcapsular circumferential homogeneous eosinophilic band of liquefactive necrosis um, with intralesional degenerating metasicaria and then all of the associated features of cataract exchange in the, in the lens that you would describe in any species. So again, morphological diagnosis, cataractus change, subcapsular, multifocal, moderate, with intralenticular trematode metasicaria, and the etiology is uh, diplostomum species or diplostomum spathoceum. This is a, an image of a sword tail, and um, the etiological diagnosis here is a salomic Pentostomiasis. Um, pentostomes again are going to be diagnosed on uh, on histopathology, although you probably could have a, a good um, recognition of the parasite just based on the gross presentation. A study of necropsies, a study at the University of Florida looked at uh, the necropsy of sword tails in particular with pentostomiasis, and categorize the findings as uh, prominent swellings within the skin and migration tracts through the muscle, as well as the encapsulated juvenile nymph stages throughout the body cavity, as well as within the connective tissue of several of the organs. Can we stop it? Okay, sorry about that. Can we stop the filming for a second? No. Okay. All right, in this freshwater cobbler, we're now looking at uh, arthropods, and this is the anchor worm. Branchitis and dermatitis, proliferative, granulomatous, multifocal, moderate, with intralesional arthropods. And uh, Lernia species is, um, is the, uh, the name of this. What we're looking at is the genus of crustaceans which attach themselves to the skin and fins of freshwater fish, causing ulceration. Effect, affected fish will often swim, swim sluggishly and then uh, grow poorly. And there will be mortality, but it's predominantly affected either with gill damage or with um, secondary bacterial infection or simply heavy infections causing an inability for the fish to feed properly. Now, from a parasitology standpoint, only the fe females are parasitic, um, but, and the, the most important pathology associated with it is often right around the anchor site or where the, the, um, 
uh, crustacean is actually attached. But as you can imagine, there's going to be um, loss of the branchial filaments associated with the presence simply through friction, if not the actual um, attachment damage caused by the crustacean. And in this case, branchitis, necrotizing and proliferative, granulomatous, multifocal, mild, with intralesional arthropods. And this is the Lernia species anchor worm. They infect all freshwater uh, species of fish, but are a serious problem in the saprinids, the bait minnows, the goldfish, and carp. So clinically, as I said, the parasite will infect the skin, usually at the base of a fin, and then the head develops into an anchor and um, holds the female in place on the host. Then the female will develop these two egg sacs, which are the finger-like projections that you see at the base of the, of the parasite, and, um, and live out their life there. Um, there are other types of crustacea which are found predominantly within the gills, and these are the um, uh, Aragacilius species, and these can cause severe gill damage. In this case, morphological diagnosis, dermatitis, granulomatous, multifocal mild with intralesional arthropods. Uh, while one of these parasites is very close to the eye, it's actually attached to the skin next to the eye and probably these were completely incidental in this animal. However, in this animal, you can imagine that this would have been um, extremely difficult for the animal to live with, especially to hunt with. And so in this arrow-tooth flounder, the morphological diagnosis, eye, keratitis, granulomatous, focally extensive, severe, with intralesional arthropods. And again, we're looking at a Lernia species. In this animal, you can see the cutaneous wounds associated with the attachment points in Lernia. In this Dorado, dermatitis, hemorrhagic, granulomatous, multifocal to coalescing, marked. Now, this is a pretty horrific parasite. Uh, this arthropod will invade the mouth of the fish, destroy the tongue, and then live in the place of the tongue of the fish and uh, compete with the fish for food that is ingested and will live for a while. Now some of these fish will do quite, seem to do quite well um, even with the presence of this, um, this arthropod within its mouth. So the morphological diagnosis in this case, glossal loss, diffuse, severe, with intralesional arthropod. Um, and these are Ceratothoa species uh, arthropods. And here's another example of the parasite. Okay, on to neoplastic diseases. Use of fish as cancer models have been predominantly based on finding natural populations with an increased incidence of tumors. And, um, and as a result, had been used as a study, um, occasionally as a study for, as an animal model. Um, by looking at the inciting factors which would cause the emergence of these tumors, environmental contamination being primary example, carcinogens. In um, 1908, an increased, population, increased papillomas in a population of barbels in Germany was shown to have intracellular inclusion bodies within the neoplastic cells, and as such, one of the um, a viral etiology was suggested. And then half a century later, hepatic neoplasia in brown bullhead catfish and white suckers was associated with chemical carcinogenesis. And because of these early findings and the determination that the pathogenesis of these neoplastic processes was similar to those that were studied in mammalian models, a wide variety of species, uh, fish species have been used in uh, carcinogenesis testing. Um, we're going to look at some of the more interesting or pathologically specific uh, neoplastic processes in fish, but I would recommend that um, Dr. Spitzenbergen's Pola notes be consulted um, as well as her website on zebrafish for 
a, uh, for, for an excellent list of neoplastic diseases that are used as from either as models or spontaneous within um, fish populations in research. So in this case, this is actually a wild caught fish and this is spontaneous melanoma in this animal. However, there is a model of invasive melanoma which occurs in the offspring of F1 hybrid platyfish swordtail crosses with the spotting traits um, when they're crossed with swordtails. The, the F1 hybrids with this spotting trait will de develop pre-melanosomes and then with the F1 crossed with the swordtail will produce frank mel uh, melanomas and it's believed that this is due to enhancement of the, the uh, macromelanophore gene due to defic deficiency of modifier genes which then leads first to a melanosis and then finally to invasive melanomas. Fibrosarcomas, these will often occur in the subcutis and the submucosa of the head and occasionally within the skeletal muscle. There is an association in fish that have ex been exposed to radiation and chemical carcinogens and um, the literature reports that these tumors can be severely locally invasive and destructive but they've never been noted to metastasize. If, um, if for residents who are watching this see this species pop up on a gross exam of any kind, then you need to be considering a very specific disease. The bicolor damselfish is a, um, is a model of disease for von Recklinghausen's neurofibromatosis. And so the bicolor damselfish neurofibromas um, are, uh, or, or damselfish schwannomas are important as an animal model for this human disease. It's not perfect as the model goes because the, um, the fish tumors and pigmented lesions are often malignant in these cases, whereas the, uh, the human variant, which are called cafe au lait spots, are traditionally benign. However, if you were to see lumps and bumps on a bicolored damselfish, then um, schwannoma needs to be at the very top of your differential list. This is a tumor of the mucocutaneous junction of the lip near the midline, which occurs in adult female angelfish. And grossly, the neoplasm starts as a small white vesicle, which progressively enlarges to become a firm lobulated exophytic mass over a period of some weeks. Um, on cut sections, the tumors are white with, a, uh, with occasionally having cavernous centers that are clear, filled with clear fluid. And histologically, the neoplasm is composed of densely packed spindle cells that are arranged in streams and bundles and occasional whorls and are overlain with a thick stratified squamous epithelium. Um, etiology is unknown, but there is a type A retrovirus which has been isolated from the affected tissue and is theorized to contribute to the carcinogenesis. However, Cox postulates have not been satisfied to date in these animals. Walleyes are susceptible to another um, retrovirus, in this case a type C retrovirus has been isolated from the neoplastic cells. And this is dermal fibrosarcoma of walleye pike. And they arise from the dermis and spread to form multifocal nodules over the entire body. However, in more, most cases, even though the tumors can get quite large and be locally invasive, uh, they are considered to be benign. This is the the type C retrovirus has been um, termed as walleye dermal sarcoma virus. And these are nice examples of um, multifocal to coalescing exophytic dermal sarcomas with central umbilication. Now I had listed the dermal sarcoma virus as another one of the differentials for lymphocystis. And it is, although you can, you can see that these nodules are much larger. This is a large fish, first of all, and then those nodules are quite large. So it is a potential differential, but it should be further down. Now, this presentation here can give you that impression of those coalescing um, uh, granules, but this is actually, again, a 
a mass of irregularly packed um, fusiform cells arranged in streams and bundles. And this is the um, dermal fibrosarcoma of walleye pike. Osseous and cartilaginous transformation has been described in some cases. And um, one thing that's important is that the tumors in walleyes need to be differentiated from several other pathologies, which have also been described in walleye. The first we've already touched on because lymphocystis can affect walleye just as, as uh, other species. But diffuse epidermal hyperplasia is associated with a herpes virus in this species. And then there is another disease called discrete epidermal hyperplasia, which is also theorized to be retrovirally associated. In northern pike, it's another fish that has a, a very specific virally induced disease, and this is a lymphosarcoma, and this is also caused by a type C retrovirus. It's an epizootic condition in northern pike and um, in certain regions of North America. The lesion develops as a hemorrhagic ulcerative cutaneous mass, usually on the heads, the mouth, or the sides, with invasion into the adjacent tissue and uh, metastasis to the spleen, liver, and kidney. Um, there is a seasonal prevalence of these tumors, which suggests that water temperature probably plays a role in the epidemiology of the disease. Now, this is a zebrafish, um, and seminomas are considered to be the, uh, the most common spontaneous tumors in zebrafish, um, with well, I should say the testicular tumors are, the testicular neoplasms are the most common spontaneous tumor with seminomas being the vast majority of those. And this is per research that Dr. Spitzenbergen has done um, in zebrafish. The, uh, the bulk of reported seminomas are uh, spermatocytic seminomas, which undergo spermatogenic differentiation um, up to but excluding the final stage of maturation. The tumor is extremely common in older male zebrafish with an incidence rate that exceeds 50%. I include this simply because it is a recent veterinary pathology uh, article in FISH, and um, it described 11 cases of neuronal embryonal neoplasia in adult captive telios. They were um, located within one or both of the eyes of eight fish and the skin of three other fish. And the ocular, ocular neoplasms most often presented as either a unilateral or bilateral exophthalmia. Um, the seven ocular and, the one, and one cutaneous mass uh, were composed of small triangular carrot-shaped neoplastic cells with uh, flexner wintersteiner type rosette formation. And the authors determined that the location of the tumors and both the microscopic and ultrastructural features were suggestive of retinoblastomas. Transplantable tumors are an acceptable gold standard in cancer studies in rodents. Um, and the progress of this model in zebrafish has long been constrained by a lack of true inbred lines in zebrafish. But recently, hepatic neoplasia in fish has been studying following the induction of carcinogens. And the, um, this particular animal that you're seeing was one which was derived from several lines of clonal zebrafish which, were allowed, which uh, allow for serial transplantation of tumor cells from one fish to the other without the need for sublethal gamma, gamma irradiation. Hepatocellular adenomas is the most common spontaneous and induced hepatic tumor in fish, um, and the hepatocellular carcinomas, cholangioadenomas, and cholangiocarcinomas are also quite common. One other exciting um, scientific advancement with zebrafish is the production of the transparent zebrafish, which was recently reported. And specifically, it allows for the in vivo monitoring of metastasis by um, labeling the actual neoplastic cells and then watching in the live animal the spread of the tumor cells um, uh, as they implant at distant sites from the original the original tumor.
This is tissue from a brown bullhead, and if you see a brown bullhead catfish, then there are a couple of, um, of tumors that need to be considered. One is a cholangiocarcinoma, as in this case. What we have here is the liver with these multifocal uh, nodules of, of neoplastic cells with central umbilication. These are cholangiocarcinomas. Uh, or the other thing is going to be viral papillomas within the oral cavity. And we'll look at those in just a few slides. The liver neoplasms of the bile duct origin are diagnosed either as a cholangioma or a cholangiocarcinoma in these, and there's strong evidence of environmental contamination associated with tumor prevalence in certain states, especially around the Great Lakes, using um, where they use the tumor prevalence as an indicator of pollution levels. The grossly the cholangiomas are uh, white or cream-colored foci or nodules which can grow to be several centimeters in diameter and they'll often bulge above the liver capsule but sometimes they can be difficult to palpate um, on the external surface of the tumor and maybe act of the of the liver and maybe internal. So neoplasms of hepatocellular origin may also be grossly similar to these bile duct tumors and you need to differentiate. We saw this disease earlier. This is tissue from a koi, and so this is suprinted herpes virus type 1, or carp pox. As I said, it was closely related to um, uh, KHV, although it's not as, as infectious, and although it's unsightly and due to the presence of these wax-like lesions on the, on the um, cutaneous surface, uh, they usually do not cause significant morbidity. The, there are reports, however, of transformation to squamous cell carcinoma. Herpes virus is most contagious in younger fish or in cases of immunocompromised secondary distress, significant changes in water temperature and poor husbandry uh, resulting in immunocompromise. And grossly, the disease will present as these whitish, waxy, wart-like lumps anywhere on the skin, the mouth, or the fins. And um, if you remember from that Original, those original images, and from this one, they tend to look like those drops of wax on the skin. Histologically, biopsies of the masses are, are consistent with papillomas and are characterized by a marked benign epidermal hyperplasia without inclusion bodies or much of an inflammatory infiltrate. But transmission electron microscopy has revealed that there are intranuclear herpes viral virions um, within the neoplastic cells. As I said, we were going to talk about the, um, the oral papillomas in the brown bullhead catfish, and this is an example of it. Um, they're commonly affected by these epidermal neoplasms of the mouth and skin. The majority of the neoplasms will occur on the lips and are, diagnostic as, are diagnosable as uh, benign papillomas. Uh, there have been reports of dermal invasion and malignant transformation. They're most frequently located at the corners of the mouth or the lips, and they can either occur singly or in multiple locations. Um, they sometimes surround the entire mouth and can cause difficulty eating. And the frequently occurrence, frequency of occurrence increases with age, and prevalence um, may exceed 40% of older fish within certain populations. And here's another example of, the, um, of these papillomas in the brown bullhead. The literature varies as to the, the cause in the case of some of these tumors. However, the, um, the majority tend to uh, consider that chemical carcinogenesis are associated with the um, production of these oral tumors. However, there have been a couple of reports that have suggested ultrastructural evidence of viral particles within the neoplastic cells. Um, Dr. Spitzenbergen and Dr. Wolf have reported extensively on the disease, and while their ultrastructural examination did not find a viral etiology, um, they concluded that the specificity of the tumors to the brown bullhead and the predilection of the tumor incidence in heavily polluted waters suggests a very complex pathogenesis with maybe more than simply a chemical carcinogenesis. And finally, here's another example of the, um, 
papillomas in the brown bullhead. Okay, we're going to finish up with miscellaneous diseases. This, uh, this disease in these sharks, these are images of gastric prolapse in sand tiger sharks. And it's only a couple of, um, of instances, but an interesting disease. Now, the sharks can prolapse their stomachs normally out of their mouth, um, and that's one way of their cleaning the internal aspect of the stomach. However, in these cases, the prolapse occurred through the gill, um, the gill slit and caused entrapment and then would have resulted in uh, anorexia and probably death. Well, this is the only other slide I have of a, a non-fish within this, um, this presentation, but this is an important series of diseases that are associated with this. What we're looking at is uh, carapace, um, uh, dermatitis, necroulcerative, multifocal to coalescing, severe, with uh, you know, chitin loss, you could say. And this is a, an example in an American lobster of epizootic shell disease. It's a seasonal disease whose cause is still being researched. And, but currently, the disease is believed to be caused by a gram-negative chitinolytic bacterium. However, it is not uh, fully determined. There are three main types of shell disease in lobsters. The first was described in 1992 and is call, called impoundment shell disease. And this involves bilaterally symmetrical, round, blackened, erosive lesions that are centered upon the animal's dorsum. Uh, the etiology for this type of disease has been reported to be associated with Fusarium solani. The second form is called burn spot or rust spot shell disease and involves individual circular lesions in various locations along the carapace and is often associated with fungal invasion which, um, in which the, the hyphae are theorized to invade at the pores and the pits within the chitinous shell. And then this is the third form of the disease, and it is currently poorly understood, but it specifically affects American lobsters in North England, in, um, I'm sorry, in New England and off of Long Island. This is another interesting disease, and one which, in which the, um, the colloquial name keeps changing. It was also termed as hole in the head disease, which is why I avoid using the name in the catfish. But um, the literature will discuss it as either uh, head and lateral line erosion or um, simply lateral line erosive disease. It's typically a disease of South American cichlids, discus and angelfish, and Oscars uh, tend to develop the disease more frequently than any, any of the other related fish. Um, however, angelfish, tangs, groupers, and to a lesser degree, lionfish and damselfish and clownfish are also susceptible within marine aquaria. Currently, there is no uh, consensus of opinion in terms of what is the cause of this disease. There was, for a period, suggestion that hexamida or a hexamida-like flagellate was theorized to spread from the intestinal tract hematologically and cause these lesions um, with then secondary infection by bacterial or fungi. And then another theory relates to malnutrition and mineral imbalances leading to skeletal damage. The, um, the key diagnostic feature is uh, exhibited by, within channel catfish in one study, showed bilateral focal skin de depigmentation over the lateral line. And this gross depigmentation was because of a loss of expanded spreading melanocytes at the dermoepidermal uh, derma junction, spreading of the melanocytes with formation of long cell processes, and then the results in blackened appearance of the skin. And because the pathology and apparent etiology of, of um, uh, head and lateral line erosion has been described as highly variable, it appears to be more of a clinical sign rather than a disease, a specific disease or syndrome. And therefore, it's been proposed that the clinical sign be referred to as lateral line depigmentation um, because this description seems to most accurately encompass all cases of the presentation that have been reported in fish. A few more miscellaneous diseases. 
This is a case that occurs um, relatively commonly within older zebrafish and pericardial effusion with dilatative cardiomyopathy, but the actual cause is unknown. Now, this is considered to be one of the more important diseases of cultured fish, and um, although the disease has been seen in living fi fish living in water that undergo an algal bloom, the, what actually happens is uh, with a supersaturation of the water by a gas, usually nitrogen or oxygen, there is um, incorporation of the gas within the fish, and typically what you'll end up seeing is this uh, presentation of these gas bubbles within the eyes, the gills, and the fins. Fish fry are highly susceptible, and the air emboli are often seen grossly within the yolk sac. But the eyes are typically what, um, what the presentation will be. Scoliosis in this Atlantic Manhattan could be associated with any number of diseases, but um, vitamin C deficiency is one possibility, as well as mycobacteriosis. And then finally, goiter is seen within fish, and this has the same essential presentation as we see um, in pathogenesis as we see within mammalian species. And this concludes the presentation. Uh, there are a large variety of um, photographic credits, and I I, um, unfortunately, you really can't make them out in terms of the slides, but the, um, the vast majority of these excellent photographs came from a variety of hardworking pathologists and, uh, and fish enthusiasts, and I very much appreciate um, their use for education. So thank you very much.